Um, at La Trobe University, we've had a Living with Disability Research Group now for the last three years. And what it does is it brings together researchers from across the university who are interested in looking at better lives for people with particularly cognitive disabilities. So there's, um, there's a strong research program around people with acquired brain injury, there's a strong research program around people with intellectual disabilities and one around people with mental health problems. And what we're really interested in doing is not rehabilitation and skills training types of things, but looking at how people can live a good life in the community. And we're interested in trying to compare and contrast between the different, different groups of people to see what, what, what they have in common in terms of the support that's necessary and what, what are the unique needs that people uh, have to be addressed to support people to have a good life. So we have a, quite a lot of funded research projects um, and I sort of manage and oversee those and we have good partnerships with a range of organisations in the community that are research partners. And we publish quite a lot of peer-reviewed literature and we try and also uh, disseminate our, our research in other ways to groups in the community. From my perspective and the perspective of the research we've been doing here over the last few years and from the research that uh, from the Tizard Centre in the UK, the most critical element of a high quality service is staff practice. So what staff do on a day to day basis to support the people that they're working with is probably the most important element of, of a quality service. And then the question is, how do you get the staff, how do you support the staff to provide high quality support? What are the organisational factors and structures behind that to produce that staff practice and to, to produce a, a positive culture within the organisation? And that the next most important element is probably then practice leadership um, and structures to support that and a coherence within the organisation that practice is valued and understood and replicated um, through the organisation from the board, the CEO, the senior and the junior managers all the way down. My advice would be to any, any consumer of a service in, in the future is that you can't believe what you're told, you need to go and have a look. So observing practice, uh, looking at what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, how the staff behave, um, whether there's consistency from one day to the next, whether the staff know the people that they're working with. You can tell those things by looking as a consumer. So there's going to be a lot of marketing material and things, but you know our evidence suggests you need to observe um, because that gives you a much better impression. And we're working at the moment on some, some sort of indicators of what to look for in a good service. You know, um, what's the demeanour of the people? How do the staff actually interact with people, are they, are they respectful? When you go to a staff, are people engaged or are they sitting there doing nothing but looking very clean and tidy? When they're out in the community, are they being supported to interact with the people around them? Um, are they making choices in the supermarket? Are they handing over the money in the cafe or are they just being minded? And you can tell that fairly quickly, but you, you know, consumers are going to need some indicators around some of that stuff. And I don't think we've been good at articulating what you actually need to look for. And I think that's a challenge over the next couple of years to hone some of that material down. You know, services have been very complacent because they've been block funded and they haven't actually had to demonstrate outcomes for people. Uh, the outcomes have been more in a sort of negative sense. Well, are people safe? You know, uh, are the risks managed? Um, have they, how many incidents have they been, those sorts of things. And now they're going to have to address, well, how are we demonstrating that we're uh, giving people choice, that we're giving people a voice, that we're including people in the community, that we're supporting people to make relationships. And for some very traditional services, that's going to be a real challenge because they haven't really addressed those sorts of things at all. And, and I think I heard the other day that you know there's a number of services that are amalgamating, so they're getting bigger. Now that's probably a bit of a, of a concern in a sense because some of our evidence suggests that actually smaller services do better. But I think some services will go out of business, will realise that they don't have the capacity uh, to deliver the type of quality support that's necessary. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. You know, I don't think... We haven't seen many services go down over the last few years, and perhaps a lot, some of them should have done. 
I think they have to think about, well, who are our customers? So who, who is it that we're, we're offering to provide support for? Um, is it a particular group of people with disabilities? I think we're going to see, hopefully, some increasing uh, recognition of the diversity among people with disabilities. So there will be some agencies who will say, we support people with severe and profound disabilities, and this is what support and choice looks like for this group. These are the challenges uh, that we can see in that practice, and we're going to begin to address and articulate those challenges and support our staff to be really good practitioners in that area. So I think we'll begin to see a sort of differentiation, much more of services, which we used to have a number of years ago, and then we sort of lumped everybody in together, um, and I think we'll see more sort of niche services that have become more specialised and begin to build a reputation for delivering what they say they deliver. So people, will, they, will have to, they will have to look to themselves and say, what are we good at? Uh, who are we serving? How are we doing that? What knowledge are we basing it on? So it will have to be a much more professionalised uh, service sector than we've really ever had in the past in disability. When you look at the, the middle managers in, in disability services, when you look at um, the senior managers, very few of them actually have tertiary qualifications and very few of them have qualifications that are relevant to supporting people with disability. It's like we've had lots of people have come up from having no no uh, formal qualifications and there haven't been places for them to go back to and to get skilled up. We haven't had uh, graduate diplomas or postgraduate courses in, in disability services. That whole education sector hasn't responded because there hasn't been a demand. Mm. We tried to, to think about that a couple of years ago um, and bumped into a brick wall because the, the, the salary scales and things don't give people any extra um, recognition. There's no extra money if you have a degree or not. And we have to change those sorts of values and things and start to skill up the leaders within the disability sector. So they're not only good managers, but also have content knowledge as well. We've got to marry those two things together, I think. If you're a consumer, if you're a person with intellectual disability, or if you're a family member, I, I think you need, to, you need to visit the service and you need to see what's going on, and you need to hear what other consumers are saying about it. You need to hear what other family members are saying about it. Um, and go back a few times, <laughs> not just once, when it's, uh, and you drop in unexpectedly at different times of the day or you know, different days of the week, because what we know is there's huge variability over time in services. So I think to be an informed consumer, it's like when, the analogy is when parents uh, look for schools for their children, they, they don't just go on the guided tour with the principal. <laughs> they need to go and spend time in the classroom over different days and, and watch what's going on. And I think that's what consumers need to start to do. And that means that staff need to change their expectations and begin to accept that they're going to be observed and that you know, they're open to scrutiny, not only by their managers and their practice leaders, but by consumers and significant others for consumers.